Thank you for checking out this talk from the Fierce Families Conference that took place back in October of 2023. Our mission for this conference was to put God's design for marriage and family on full display, and then to equip marriages and families to live out God's beautiful design in the context in which he's placed them. So if you'd like to learn more about the Fierce Families Conference, perhaps to attend a conference in the future, or to bring the Fierce Families Conference to your own area, just go to fiercefamilies.com. All right, fantastic. Let's go to the Lord. King Jesus, you're awesome, and we're not. would like to be more like you, but we need your help to do it. So Holy Spirit, I pray that you would come here, that you would fill us up, that you would change the pictures that we have in our minds, and that you would uh, mobilize our hands and feet to, to be different, do different, uh, and just really be like you. We pray against the enemy against any type of distractions as well that would be wholly present in this time. In your name, amen. All right, you guys can go ahead and be seated. My name's John Lovell. I am a Georgia boy, as you found out in my um, introduction. Uh, however, I am not new to Washington. I didn't just hop a plane and fly here to the first time to visit you in Woke-tastic Washington Behind enemy lines, by any means, I was here before. I was stationed at Fort Lewis, Washington, 22 years ago is when I came here. I met this dude, Ryan Frederick, right there. You see the goofy-looking guy in the back room? Everybody turn and look at the goofy-looking guy. I knew him. Uh, I was brand new to faith. I kind of grew up in the, the Bible Belt. We learned like Noah's Ark story every Sunday school ever until you grow up long enough to go to college, learn to hate your parents' values, and pop smoke and go. Uh, and so, you know, you're kind of raised under the shadow of the steeple. This was not my faith. I gave a rip. I caused a whole bunch of problems. I was a wild kid, and at 15 years old, I had caused my father enough disappointment that he sent me off to boarding school, and I was out of the house. So at 15 years old, uh, I got saved dramatically after joining the military at 19, a radical conversion that'll be uh, a, a good story for a different time. But suffice it to say, the Lord really, I felt like Jesus accosted me. Uh, like I was uh, just absolutely, um, I don't know, hijacked on, on the road. I was going one way in one direction and all of a sudden I had this huge conversion uh, I'm now a Jesus follower. I'm also entering into the special operations. And so it's kind of like, wait, I was, I was calling, kind of going a different missional route. And then Jesus turned me around and put me on a different track. And so it was a little bit jarring to say the least when I landed here in Washington state, day one at Fort Lewis, Washington, down the road, they packed me for war. And so I'm preparing for that, but I'm also a new Christian. I uh, ended up joining a church and that's where I met our conference organizer, Ryan Frederick. And so we go back a way, way long way. He was leading worship at the time. And I am entering in church with brand new eyes open to the gospel and saying, hey, how do you be a godly man? What does that look like? You know, so I'm looking around church and uh, it's, a, uh, it's a pretty extreme juxtaposition based on I'm going like, Monday through Saturday, I'm doing the door-kicking, terrorist-hunting, ranger training thing. And then on Sunday, you know, I'm, I'm among churchy people, doing churchy things. And so I'm like, all right, how do I reconcile these? And I, I will say, it was really jarring for me. It was pretty challenging, to say the least. I'm like, well, what does it mean to be a godly man? And what I, no I noticed some things right off of like, these guys are really nice. That's cool. I'm not used to nice. You're a buddy in special operations of like, you know, they're going to make, you're going to get made fun of relentlessly. I remember I was dating a girl for five years. I got dumped uh, and uh, all the dudes just roared with laughter at me. There was no sympathy. And that was just, that was Ranger Battalion. <laughs> Eat or be eaten. And so uh, anyway, but I noticed I'm like, hey, these guys are nice. That's change. They seemed real polite and well-mannered and kind I noticed a sensitivity that I wasn't used to, and it was, it was definitely a, a different, it was a different thing. And so I'm like, all right, how's that work for me as a man of like, I'm, I'm this kind of guy on Sunday, and then I'm, I'm, uh, it didn't quite fit as much. It's like, we want to hunt the terrorist and shoot him in the face, but we're real nice to him. And I, I don't know, it was a tough time for me. I was going through some stuff, uh, but it was also a little difficult 
in that I was giving myself to reading Bible. I was learning about who Jesus was, and I'm learning like birth of special operations in the Old Testament with David's mighty men and then King David himself, and I'm seeing the apostles being persecuted and uh, tortured, and I'm seeing early martyrdoms, and I'm seeing bold declaration of truth. And so what I was doing in the military, what I was reading in Scripture, had more of a gritty, long-suffering, strong, bold, unapologetic, intense feel to it than the church that I was visiting. And that was really problematic. And so I'm looking to, basically, what is this picture I have in my head of the ideal man? And I'm picturing also in my head, what is Jesus look like? Who is Jesus? What does he look like? And so th this was some of my earliest struggles as I was trying to figure out what in the world it means to be a Christian. What's it mean to be an ideal man? Now, I'm, I'm kind of like a brass tacks, bullet points kind of guy. I'm like, oh, okay, lots of words, 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 words. What do you want me to do? Tell me the things. Give me the bullet. You're, you're one of those guys. You're shaking your head of like, yeah, all right, yay, fluffy words and pretty thoughts. Give me the bullet points. I want to do the thing. Uh, and so that, that's kind of how I naturally am. However, I, will, I have learned this. The pictures that we hold in our head are some of the most powerful forces in our lives. And if you get the picture in your head wrong, it's not going to go very well for you. You're going to be going in the wrong direction. Early in my vocational career years, I had the idea of a successful man, and he works extremely hard, and he always answers his phone when it rings, and he solves problems, and he puts out fires, and he builds an empire, and he's real successful. And then I met this guy, and I went to him for some mentorship. And though his success life was just awesome, his home life was a wreck. He was on a... Uh, he was a young guy, like early 30s, but he was already on his second or third marriage. Uh, and he didn't have any rest or downtime. He was just a holy given over to success. And I remember thinking of like, I came here to learn about what, uh, how to be a successful man. And what I learned is that this would-be mentor is not a successful man. The picture in my head didn't match what was in reality in front of me. I'm like, well, that's no good. And if you get the picture of Jesus wrong in your head, uh, our trajectory and our daily walk toward that thing is all going to be wrong as well. And let's face it, we build these caricature, cartoon pictures of Jesus all the time. One, I was having problems with because I read of uh, kind of a gritty, masculine, New Testament faith. And then I found this sweetie pie Church, and I'm not here to beat up on Jesus' bride. Love the church and all of it. And that's Jesus' bride and that's part of it. So I'm not going to be beat up the church kind of thing because that's us, yay for the church. But man, it is really good to find later some healthy churches with some good, strong men in the midst. And I'm like, well, that, this is how, that's what I needed. That's what uh, I was looking for. These guys had a more full-bodied picture of who Jesus was. Now I'll submit this, that Jesus is not a lover or a fighter. Jesus is both. Not like 50-50 either. He's 100% lover, 100% fighter. Did you know that? You're like, yeah, technically. But do you really think of Jesus as like fighter commander Jesus? You know, or is it sweet baby Jesus? You know, everyone's got different pictures in their head of who Jesus is, right? And so um, we really want to make sure that we get those pictures Correct. I, I, I see Jesus as sacrificial lamb, and I see Jesus as a lion of the tribe of Judah. And I'm going to get to some text right there, and so we'll be able to look at that more. Uh, but I will say, as I was going through the New Testament for the very first time after salvation, I saw all these clues uh, as to who Jesus was that wasn't really matching what I saw on the ground. And I saw, that of like I guess as a military guy, hunting terrorists and risking my life and multiple combat tours over and over and over, I needed a war captain. I needed a strong leader. I needed, I needed a faith that would sustain me when I was terrified uh, and when I needed to be bold and when I needed to be strong. Being real kind and polite and nice and sensitive wasn't going to help me on the battlefield. 
I needed a captain, right? And I found one in the New Testament. And it wasn't until I would come back from overseas where I would find these guys don't see Jesus the way I do. And so all I, I'm not saying I was right and they were wrong. I'm just saying I had a different picture. And I want you to lean in and see some of the clues we got in the uh, New Testament. Now, Jesus came on a singular mission. He didn't come as lion. He came to die. It was a rescue operation. That was the point. That's why you don't see him. Uh, you don't see certain aspects of Jesus that are very obvious in glory now uh, that, that we would more uh, as readily see in the New Testament. But you do see glimpses coming out. And these things I picked up on right away. In Matthew chapter 8, verse 28, um, we see Jesus confronting two demons. And this was a big clue for us. Two demon-possessed men met him coming out of the tomb so fierce that no one could pass that way. What is that picture? Say they were so fierce no one could get that way. What's that mean? So they will beat you to a bloody pulp. These, do, these are bad dudes. Don't go near them. And behold, they cried out when they saw Jesus. What have you to do with us, O Son of God? Have you come here to torment or to torture us before the time. <laughs> so this is amazing because we see beautiful Jesus, kind and loving. But the demons saw a completely different Jesus, didn't they? These demons that could just take anyone to task, beat them to a pulp. They saw Jesus and begged him not to torture them before the time. I got chill bumps there. I'm like, whoa. What were the disciples doing of like, Torture, you're gonna, do you, do you know him already? How do you know, how do you know him? And he tortures, he tortures, what, what is, what, who, is, who are we following here? Who is this guy? And it's a big clue that though Jesus came on a mission to die, there's a lot more to who Jesus is than in our first glance, Right? He wasn't just a Middle Eastern carpenter who came to be really nice and then die for you. There's a glorified Jesus that is another part of the story that is ever so important for the heart of man to wrap, uh, wrap our heads around because that's our ideal. So there's Matthew 8, verse 28 and 29. Here's another clue. This is 28. No, this is 26, 53. So they're in the Garden of Gethsemane. Peter takes out his sword, cuts off one of the ears of a servant that was there to arrest him. This is before he is crucified, the, um, the night before. And he says, put your sword back in its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. And then Jesus says this, Do you think that I cannot appeal to my Father, and he will at once send me more than twelve legions of angels? What's he saying of like, hey, man, Peter, thank you, adorable sword. Um, I'm a war captain of legions of invincible angels. <laughs> thank you for your protection, <laughs> you know, uh, absolutely adorable. It's like, okay, there, there's something else here of like, Jesus is basically saying like, hey, I, I can command legions of angels here. You see the hints come out. Here's one more, Matthew 20. I say one more like I'm not going to get carried away and say more of them. This is uh, right after Jesus um, has risen from the grave. He has spent 40 days hanging out with people, uh, having meals, walking along roads, having conversations, and he's about to ascend into heaven. He says this, he says, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. He makes a commission. I'm like, hey, here's your new life's work. Go baptize, go uh, give the gospel to all nations. And he says, all authority is mine. So here's your new mission for all people for all life. Here you go. Of like, I, I see a powerful, strong Jesus in authority who angels shriek in horror of, who commands legions of angels. Elsewhere, he says, no one takes my life. I give my life. I have the authority to give it. I have the authority to take it up again right? It's like, man, there's something, uh, something 
were missing about uh, Jesus. In Revelation 19, the whole, there's no more hints anymore at this point. Here of like, Jesus is far more than we realize he is. There's more to the picture and story of Jesus that's ever so important for the heart of man to follow. We need to adjust our picture of who Jesus is. And in Revelation 19, now the mission to come and die and woo the hearts of men and women uh, to salvation. There is carrot, but then you also see stick. You see terrifying Jesus. Uh, some of the disciples saw this. Peter and John saw this at the transfiguration when all of the sudden glory is ripped through flesh and he is terrified because he sees Jesus in, I don't know, some type of, it's it, like future glory. I'm not sure what that was, but transfiguration, it's almost like the veil of the lamb was torn back and he saw horrifying, awesome, awestruck, wonderful Jesus. That's what it was, the transfiguration where, where a, a, a simple man is shown to be alpha and omega kind of thing. And so you see these pictures. Now, that, that, picture's, uh, that picture can be contrasted with this in Revelation 19, verse 11. Then I saw heaven op opened up and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True. And in righteousness, he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood. And by the name which he is called is the word of God. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God. and The word was God. And in verse 14 of John 1, the word uh, became flesh and made his dwelling among us. This is unmistakably Jesus. Now, here we go. And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, were white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his, why were the why were the armies of heaven following him? Yeah, because he's the commander of the Lord's army, most dangerous being of all time ever. Jesus Christ, the commander of the armies of the Lord. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. And he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty on his robe and on his thigh. He has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And there's the lion. There is our great war captain. Um, I'm, my day job is uh, a thing called Warrior Poet Society. And it's based off this next text I want to show you. Um, and, and maybe I'll just summarize because I've already gone, I'm, I'm already off pace. Uh, but the idea of warrior poet, it's that lion and lamb thing. It, it's the lover and a fighter. It was my own personal journey trying to reconcile a bold, strong, protector, dangerous masculinity because I knew that to be true and it's woven into me. And then I want to follow Jesus and I want to be a good dad. And I want to be a, a romantic husband. I don't want to win a bunch of medals, uh, the accolades of men for strongman competitions or races or to have my name written across the sky just to lose the wife of my youth. I want to steward everything well. I'm in my 17th year, year of marriage and it is going kind of awesome. I love, love my wife. We have a very sweet relationship. It was hard fought and hard won. And what we're enjoying now is our best years. Um, I want to be fully lion and I want to be fully lamb. Now, this comes out of a real neat place. One of my favorite scriptures in Ch uh, Revelation chapter 5. What happens is the Apostle John is taken up in a vision to eternity, future, or, uh, heaven, not really sure, a lot of speculation here, but regardless, he sees this heavenly host laid out. And he's got this kind of celestial tour guide. One of the 24 elders that are listed there, 12 are supposed to be the, uh, the fathers of um, Israel, the patriarchs, and then the other 12 are the apostles, which meant one of those 12 apostles will be him in future glory. And I think Jesus is too funny to not have made him his own tour guide in future. And so just know I'm calling it before we get there 
that John led John through heaven. Anyway, John says, look, the lion of the tribe of Judah. And so you imagine the celestial throne room, which we cannot do. And so all eyes fixed on the lion of the tribe of Judah that just made an epic entrance, mic drop style. And he looks and John saw a lamb that looked like it had been mortally slain. That's what he saw. Uh, I cannot say this without chill bumps, man. It's so cool, so powerful. Uh, now, what's happening here? What the text means is, I believe all of heaven looked and saw a terrifying lion. Strong commander Jesus. And I believe John looked and saw a bloody lamb. I think both images were absolutely true. And the perspectives were different. But the line of the tribe of Judah, terrifying commander Jesus, is also the lamb that has been slain for us. And so that's how he presented himself to us. I was um, doing a bad thing. I was uh, feeding the trolls on Twitter. Every once in a while I get on Twitter. It's called X now. Uh, and uh, Ryan's in this rhythm too. We're talking about it. every week and a half. I just get in and I want to fight with the troll. You know, like da, 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 da. This guy wasn't a troll. Uh, but he said something interesting. I'm in the firearm space. So I teach like gunfighting and stuff around the country. Teach people how to be better protectors. And that's part of Warrior Poet Society uh, stuff. But he, um, we were in this, uh, I posted something. And he says, yeah, but Jesus would never pick up a gun. He would never do that. Jesus came for love. And, and it gave me pause. I'm like, uh, first off, I, I don't want to speak for Jesus unless I'm quoting scripture. Or it, it's a slam dunk theological uh, kind of statement. So I want to just have some fear of the Lord there. But uh, I, I recognize the picture in his head is not the picture of mine. What he sees is he sees the lamb clearly looking as been slain. But he has never met uh, war captain Jesus here. He's like, no, no, no. Before the incarnation, he was double-edged sword. He's hanging out with his disciples one day, one day and he said, so I saw he, uh, Satan hurtle, hurled headlong from heaven like lightning. And I think it's because he threw him. <laughs> <laughs> lightning bolt, Satan, <laughs> lawn dart. Uh, I don't know how that looked, but in my head, I saw Satan face first lawn dart into earth. And that's probably not it, but it looks great. You cannot take that from, you can't prove theologically it's not, so I'm going to go with that one. Uh, uh, but of, they, there's the commander of the Lord's army of like, no, Jesus has a double-edged sword because he has used it in the past and he will use it again in the future. Jesus, though he came first time to woo us, to love us, to sacrifice himself and die for us, when he comes back, it's to stack bodies and judge the world. Double-edged sword stuff, you know? It's the second coming, day of judgment. Woe to you who don't follow Jesus on that day. Worst day of your life, stretched on forever, right? This is a bold view of who Jesus is. And I recognize, man, this guy's Christology is, is terrible. And it's caused him to become a pacifistic, hippie, uh, Washingtonian. <laughs> Well done, Mississippi. Well done. We'll go with that. <laughs> you guys are awesome. You guys are awesome. So the first thing I wanted to do, and I think I'm almost out of time, so I've got to really rush through some stuff here. Uh, I, more than action points, I need you to see Jesus as a lion and lamb. And if we can really get that picture right, it gives us uh, the justification and the, the right to grow into aspects that God has hidden in our masculine hearts that have laid dormant because we've allowed culture to bully us into pacifism, into being uh, weak, into being soft-spoken, into self-censoring, into refusing to be bold because we might offend someone. Uh, I, I see there's two archetypes here. There's lion and lamb. Uh, we can also call them warrior and poet. I'd like us to go through some attributes of what a warrior looks like. What's a warrior look like in terms of attributes? They can be violent. They are capable of violence. They're, they're dangerous. What else? Controlled strength. All right, they're strong. Very good. Uh, it's offensive. 
yeah, they're not really care of like, oh, but how do you feel about that? You know, like not super uh, interesting. What else? Train for battle. Train for battle. All right. Skill of arms. What else? Under control. Under control. Oh, yeah, but I mean, you could be a bad warrior, not under. You could be a mercenary. So, uh, you know, but yeah, it, it controlled strength. I'm like, well, some, uh, I've known a lot of warriors <laughs> that weren't really in good control. And they're pretty good warriors. Um, uh, but just saying there's all kinds of different warriors, right? A good warrior uh, is that. Uh, how about long suffering? You know, they can take a lot of pain. How about courageous? Fierce. You know, they're not backing down. How about uh, um, ready to die, self-sacrificial for a cause? Clearly, they're putting their lives on the line for a certain cause, Conviction. There we go. You have conviction. You have a boldness. Uh, how about leadership? Leadership. When I got out of the military and I went to college, I, I was not uh, intimidated at all by our, uh, my college professors up there playing arrogant, uh, preening sophists. Uh, I was immediately ready to take them to task. I wasn't bullied around by them. I was at a completely different station of life. I'm like, I've earned my stripes, and I think you're offensive and wrong. And so, well, let's have a chat, you know? And so we do that. But there's attributes of the warrior. How about attributes of the poet? I'm sorry, patient. All right, very good. What else? Yeah, thoughtful, reflective. That's deep waters of the poet, all right? Romantic, that's fantastic, great. How about a worshiper? You know, poets are, whether they're worshiping nature or girls uh, or even God, right? Uh, a poet is a worshiper. They're, they're carried away by awe-inspiring beauty as well, uh, right? Expressive. They're expressive. They're emotion, they have emotional depth as well, right? Uh, it, uh, and poets are deeply interested in truth, and part of what a poet is is they, they seek out truth, and then they tell truth in bold and beautiful ways. Intellectual, Intellectual absolutely. And so for us as men, what we should aspire to be is warrior and poet. Really, this is, this is all these attributes brought to bear, we're 100%, both of these allow us to live a life like Jesus, like the apostles. Right now, I think culture is certainly okay with us being romantic, emotionally engaged, super sensitive, not okay with the poet aspect of seeking truth and to telling it boldly. So in that respect, though we may be poetic in many ways in our today's culture, uh, we are self-censoring of, I think a poet should be bold and courageous, and I think a, a, a warrior is also bold and courageous. But the poets among us uh, have uh, not sought truth and told it boldly regardless of what other people thought. And so that's the fault. How well are we doing as men, as warriors these days? Yeah, not super great. And typically when I did find a warrior, they wouldn't have the aspects of poet and they saw it as something weak. They saw it as something otherworldly. It's like a pendulum swing. And it was this difficulty, this, this separation that drove me nuts. And I'm like, no, you're supposed to be fully both of these. What good does it do for a warrior to be good at fighting for freedom, but uh, they have only the attributes that allow them to fight and defend freedom that they can't actually enjoy it? And put it another way, you can defend your family, but then you're so insufferable, you can't possibly keep them. Your wife's going to divorce you and your kids are going to grow up to hate you. That's what's going to happen. Uh, because you, warrior may be how we want them, but poet is, is a lot of how you keep them. Also, though, uh, women are built for us to be warriors and poets. Uh, and man, I, I think when both of these come together in the same person... Our wives really look at us in a whole different way. A lot of times women don't respect the men because though we're good on all these poetic aspects, we are not showing bold leadership. You ever heard the uh, gals always go after the bad guys? Y'all see that? That's like a high school, college thing. Y'all know it. It's, it's a thing, right? Yeah. Why do, why do the women, why do the young girls go after the bad guy? 
But typically, it's because he's exhibiting leadership characteristics that women find extremely attractive. He's, yeah, he's leading the wrong way, but at least he's leading. <laughs> at least he has confidence in that respect. And so when we can take those same attributes that aren't malfunctioning in bad ways, but we can be good men that are good leaders, that are going to be able to speak the truth in love, that are long-suffering, and so that we recognize we're carrying burdens and being able to not only carry our own junk, but we're carrying that of our family, that's a really good thing. We're not going to be self-censored and pushed around. We're going to boldly declare a true gospel as it ought to be proclaimed. But right now the world is desperate to see strong men stand up and lead with conviction and just say the simple truths. Right now, they're, they're just so woke-tastic where there's... I, I, I look through our modern day as a minefield of all the things you're not allowed to say. Ooh, you can't say that. The warrior stands up and I'm like, I can say whatever I want. You may not like it, but yeah, dudes can't become girls. You just can't do it. Nope. Next, next question. But even when I say that, of like, imagine me just typing that on Facebook and sending it out. Whoo, like a frisbee into the, into the abyss. How many of your high school friends are all caps? What? You know, just going nuts on you. I recognize this church had a lot of, um, received a lot of persecution because you chose to stay open uh, during the pandemic. Uh, right? And, and, I'm sorry, did I slip? I'm not sorry. I'm just, a warrior, I will not self-censor anymore. <laughs> I will not self-censor. If you're offended, get stronger feelings. <laughs> um, the pictures in our heads are ab- absolutely critical for, uh, for who we are as men. And my big gift to you and to me today is to put before you Jesus, who's a lover and a fighter, a warrior and a poet, a lion and a lamb forever. May we men walk in those attributes. Some of us have become very good in certain aspects of the poets. How you doing, men, in your boldness? How you doing in your strength? Are you carrying heavy burdens with a long-suffering spirit. Are you strong to do that? Are you fearless in the face of a world that hates you? Are you okay with being hated at all? Do people hate you? Jesus said, the world will hate you for my sake. If you want to be like me, people are going to hate you, right? Woe to you when all men speak well of you, for so they did the false prophets. Many of us don't want, to, uh, don't want to rock the boat. We don't want to upset anyone. Uh, we don't want to offend anyone. And we don't want anyone to hate us. And you can do that. Just know if you go that route, you're nothing like Jesus, right? Let's be strong lions and lambs. Copy? I'll close there. No, very good. Uh, King Jesus, make us more like you. You're awesome. And we get it wrong so many different ways. I pray for anybody that's discouraged in this room that instead of any type of shame or discouragement, your spirit would just come on and be strong and uh, give us a new renewed vigor and perspective to just do one little thing, walking in obedience, knowing you will grow us. You're the author and perfecter of our faith. And we praise you today, Jesus. Amen.